one of the other hats you wear is you are on, is it like you're a, a volunteer, but part of the board of the uh, CFA Research Foundation? Do I have that right? Yeah, CFA Institute Research okay. Foundation. Yeah. So can you just explain what, what that is first, and then we'll talk about the video series? Sure, sure. Yeah. So the the Research Foundation of the CFA Institute uh, is an independent uh, research organization. We We basically publish pieces, practitioner-oriented, high-level, standing the test of time kind of pieces. It's not comments on the latest developments or anything like that. It's thinking about really like profound questions in finance. We do have quite a lot of pieces to also look at specific topics like, like ESG or ETFs and things like that that might not be more like liter- literature or, um, reviews. But a lot of our, our topics are, yeah, very like informative or high level think pieces. So one top, one that recently came out was a, a collection of chapters, different authors on private credit, different mm-hmm. kinds of private credit, venture credit, infrastructure, all that kind of stuff. And um, so that's more kind of informative, but very broad kind of views on the topics that we write about. And I was co-chair of the research committee for a good while, meaning being the one who decides what ultimately gets published. And then um, I uh, thought we should do more on the marketing side. Mm. So switching from that and now head of the marketing. And that's what I started doing some videos and we're now on social media and things like that, as I mentioned. Okay, yeah. So, and of course, for all this stuff, folks, we'll, I'll put links so you can, you know, follow up on any of these things that we bring up that are, are interesting to you. This is, so this is episode 34, folks, of the Infi podcast. But yeah, so a lot, of, I, I was reviewing some of those videos. A, a lot, or several of them mentioned this phrase, alternative credit. So can you just explain what that means? Yeah, that's a, we, we did a series of four videos mm. on one piece that is this collection of, mm. um, like that I was talking about. Uh, yes, yeah, so alternative credit is basically anything that is not your standard, um, basically not a loan to a p- public company, more or less. Like it, it, it encapsulates lending to non public companies, private companies, companies that do different kind of like, um, investments in different areas. As I mentioned, like it could be infrastructure, it could be venture, other things, like whether it's, it can be like, it's a blurry concept. So that's why I'm Mm -hmm. a little bit hedging here. It can certainly be a regular bank lending to a company, Mm -hmm. but it's usually is that company being, being like a startup, like private or in some kind of niche sector. Okay. And and so for people who are like, what sorts of things are where like is there are there innovations is like technology helping to transform that area yeah that's it's that's a really that's a really good one because often you think of if you come across it you can invest in say private credit through a credit fund you become a limited partner there will be a general partner and that general partner will uh, often charge a management fee, meaning a fee of whatever money you put in the, the fund, and then a performance fee. So if it goes up 10%, maybe that person will take 2% of that, like mm-hmm. a 20% kind of performance fee. So that's uh, something that is available for people. Have some money, you need to figure out where you're going to go. But there are in- innovations out there. There are public companies that basically invest in that make those investments, just like a bank making these private lending, and then you can buy equity into that company. Mm-hmm. They're not gonna, they're not gonna like always perform. Like, they're not gonna perform the same as the credit. But here's the kicker: when I when you talk about these things, like if you think about it, like what cash flow do I have a claim on? Right, I can have it on this one fund. Was that one scenario where we're we saying if that company we're lending to is paying back money? There'll be kind of a tax on it because of the people managing the fund, and then you get some money. The other way to do it is to invest in a company that does the lending, and then you have a claim on the success of that company, which should kind of reflect the extent to which these loans are successful. If there's mm-hmm. a default, you're going to go down, decrease. What people are not so excited about, which is, has become so funny in this world, is the fact that you actually have way more. You obviously see prices you can see prices continuously if it's an equity stake in a company that could, and this would be a public company that does mm-hmm. the private lending. Whereas if it's a credit fund, you would 
not know what the return is more than maybe, maybe there'll be payout like a certain periods, like every quarter and you cannot take your money out. You pledged a certain amount of money. You committed this capital. That means that you're getting it back at the end of this contract. And that contract can be a 10 year kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So what people actually like about that is this psychological, like, well, you're not tempted to pull your money out in the bottom of the market. Okay. And I'm kind of skeptical on that view generally, not trying to sell one product or the other, but in the sense like that there this what used to be an illiquidity premium is not considered an illiquidity premium anymore because there, it's assumed that it's actually good to lock your money in and it's good to like, you know, pay that, pay the extra kind of fees, so to speak, to to lock your money in, mm -hmm. which is of course again still against the textbook theories. And I don't think really it makes sense. There's also this. Can I can I stop you, Lada? Of, just to yeah, make sure the listeners get it. So you're saying it, it's not that. Uh, of course, from the company's point of like the the people getting the funds, they benefit from being able to lock it up to know that oh yeah, we're this isn't going to get called back at a moment's notice. Like we can put this to work and have a long time for. It. But your point is traditionally, the thinking was oh yeah, for you as the outside investor to be willing to lock your money up you should be on the front end getting a higher expected return right. to compensate you for the fact that, well, geez, if I was rolling it over in T-bills, I could get my, you know, my cash out pretty quickly. Whereas here, if it's like, but you're saying now that there's at least a school of thought saying, in other words, it's not a penalty on the, on the company. It's like, you want to penalize yourself. Like you want to take away the option from yourself to be able to pull the money, money out, to be able to like protect against your future yeah. irrational behavior. Right. Okay. Tie yourself to the mass, so to speak. Yeah, and it's yeah. a little bit like part of this, why I feel like that contrived thing comes about is that people model, you're probably familiar with if you have a, an asset in finance, you look at the return and then you look at the risk. Mm. And the risk is not what the normal person would think, like, what is the risk of me dying tomorrow or something bad happening? Mm. The risk is measured as this concept of standard deviation. And if you have an asset, that does not report changes in their its value, its standard deviation is going to be very low because mm -hmm. you don't see how things are actually moving. You just you're blind to it. So in many models, like there's still like there are different ways of doing this. People do you know adjust for in different ways, but there's no like surefire way in which you could say I'm, I'm comparing apples to oranges here in terms of <laughs> apples to apples here mm -hmm. in terms of equity and its volatility, which is constant and I measure every day, can measure every second, of course, but let's say I do daily. And this one, the private equity or credit, really, anything that you're locking in and you don't see how the value is changing. And that is kind of a fallacy in, in finance where people are saying like, oh, this one, like you see these people writing in finance saying, oh, it's so good because it doesn't have, it's lower volatility. So yes, there's the liquidity premium, but on the other hand, the Volatility is low when it's, of course, just volatility behind the veil. It's actually right, right. more risky because you don't know what's happening behind the veil. Okay, so it doesn't mean it's the bad asset class at all. Right, no, I, right, I, get, I get what you're saying, but it <laughs> is the, some of that. Bit. Well, that, it, that ties into because I was wasn't sure whether to bring this up, but since you just brought up risk and return and volatility, another one that like I was just geeking out on uh, of these interviews just to give our listeners a flavor of what's here if they want to check it out mm -hmm. is you had two guys on talking about a paper they'd written on Harry Markowitz who is mm -hmm. the, the father of like modern finance theory, portfolio theory. So I, I don't know, do you, you want to speak on that a little bit? And then maybe I, I'll have a follow-up. Sure. I mean, uh, Markowitz generally, so he was, when you say modern portfolio theory, that's generally what we connect to this, a frontier that says, if you're picking the highest return for any given level of risk, then this are gonna, this is going to be the combination of different portfolios that you would choose. And for every portfolio on this kind of a line, so you have like a Y axis and an X axis. And when you, and, and on the Y axis, you will have the return and, and on the X axis, you have, you have the risk. And it won't be a straight line. It will always be the, so risk is something bad and return is something good. And therefore it's going to be a positive slope, meaning you're always going to get a little bit good with the bad but it's also going to have a, a bent curve just because of how the math works. So the modern portfolio theory approach is to say, okay, you can optimize. It's all about like kind of finding this optimal portfolio 
for each first for each level of risk. So again, like if you have this one portfolio, then you could ask, well, what if I move in any direction from here? Well, either it's going to be an impossible portfolio that is not obtainable to you, or it's going to be one that either has higher risk or, or lower return. So therefore, you can create this frontier. And then just like in economics, you can think of it as there's also a utility component to it. And I don't know how technical the audience is, but if you think about what your preferences are, there too is going to be a p- positive slope between risk and return. You are going to want to say, well, if I'm going to give up this return, then I at least want lower risk to some extent. Now, that curve is going to meet the other curve at, at a point where you can say, oh, well, for this specific individual, it will be in this specific portfolio that is perfect. Down. And individuals are different, not because they face different returns, because that's just an objective fact, mm-hmm. assumingly, presumably here, but because they have r- different risk preferences, meaning how much is it important that we're adding standard deviation here? Now, there's a lot of problematic things here that we can go through, but one is just, of course, standard deviation is not something that people actually eat for breakfast. It's not something you care about. If it's volatility on the upside, you can be really happy about that. Mm -hmm. But we measure it only in one way, which is the volatility means standard deviation. So that's one thing. And I can go on (laughs) and I can go on. Yeah. So, and then the question is, and what those authors of that paper by Markowitz pointed out was that Markowitz himself, he, um, and this is, by the way, Harry Markowitz was, he went in not as, he he ended up getting, I think it was PhD in economics at, at Chicago and nobody really understood where he's, his piece was going. It didn't fit in any bucket and mm-hmm. therefore he ended up in like in economics. And, and um, I think he was under Milton Friedman. If I, Th- That's I, what the, yeah, right. I think there, I think it was like a f- 1952, I think is when he got his PhD. Yeah, yeah. yeah f- oh, f- uh, 52 is when he published that paper. Maybe it was the same year. I don't know. I thought about that. But yeah, that, that, the, the paper that is like the uh, really like, yeah, yeah, famous one. Yeah. So what he himself pointed out is, I give you the framework. I don't know how to put in the data here. There's no objective, like, I'm not saying that we know what these data are. It's like, mm. if we did know what the data were, then we could actually optimize. Right. And then what the industry has done is to say, well, let's assume that we know what the data is and let's mm. come up with a way to know what the data is. And that's when people do trend lines of equity markets or, or all kinds of stuff where you just have to, or other kind of analysis where people come out and say, we believe that these returns are going to happen. And therefore, if we have this optimal portfolio, this is where we're going to land. 